to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. Colin, today I'm really excited. I get to share an interview that I did with a good friend of mine that I'm serving with out here in my internship, Captain Jonathan Snyder. He's a 12R, an EWO, Electronic Warfare Officer. Goes by Johnny. Awesome guy. And I also have some pretty big news to share today, Colin. What's that? He is, as of today, officially publicly announced a major select. So super excited for him and his family. Congratulations on reaching that milestone. We talked about it in the episode. You'll hear it in the interview. He was waiting anxiously for that announcement. I got my announcement in February, and we're recording this in late April. So it's kind of like, well, what's going on? It was a long announcement. We're super excited for him. So that's my announcement. That's my news. Yeah, and my addition to that is, by way of introduction, no surprise to me that he was selected for major. This guy is a genius. Yes. Such a pleasure to listen to. So many good nuggets to pull out of this episode. Johnny is amazing. Yes, and I'm super excited to bring it to you all. We've already had others on the podcast that described the CISO career field and the CISO training, but this is one of those specific career fields that he describes that CISO is only for undergraduates. It's not an actual career field. And so we're excited to close that gap on the EWO career field. And with that, we're going to turn it over to Captain Johnny Snyder. All right, Captain Jonathan Snyder. Johnny, welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much. Really excited to be here and love what uh, you and Colin have done with the podcast so far. You're addressing a lot of fantastic issues. So I am honored that uh, you think I might have something to share and to add to that. Without question. That's why you're here. So, Johnny, you are a 12R, which is not someone we've had on our podcast before. But before we get there, how did you come to the Air Force? Who are you? Where are you from? And how did you get here? (laughs) <laughs> Joining the Air Force was never a lifelong dream of mine. In college, I wanted to be a writer. Post-college, I wanted to be a policy wonk. I worked in a couple of think tanks in the Washington, D.C. area. After I found out that I was not good at that, I uh, became a bartender, which was very fulfilling. And uh, eventually, as my wife and I started having children, looked for something else a little bit more stable, a little bit more long-term. I've always had a great respect for the military and a great appreciation of its role in history and in the country, and decided to join the Air Force. Full disclosure, my dad is in the Navy, so he was a Navy career officer, and my little brother is an Army Ranger and Jump Master. They are fantastic professionals, so I had that kind of as a springboard. Okay, and you clearly chose the correct service between the Navy and the Army. I'll just throw I, I that. I think so, <laughs> and there is a little bit of... Uh, <laughs> interdepartmental jocular feuding between the three of us, definitely. That's outstanding. So how did you commission? Did you go through ROTC or did you go to the academy or OTS? I went through OTS. So it was OTS and then straight from that to uh, flight school in Pensacola. So that was my progression. What years did you go through OTS and how did you find that experience? OTS was a fantastic experience in retrospect during the time. It is yeah, exactly. exceedingly challenging. It was interesting because in my flight, we even had uh, experienced combat heart and combat rescue officers. We had tech sergeants. I think one of the other flight had master sergeants and even these very experienced professional leaders still had a lot of challenges going Going through. So it was an invigorating, challenging experience, but in retrospect, definitely a very positive one. Nice. So what year did you go through OTS? Right. That was uh, 2012. Okay. Okay. So that was the year after I went through. So probably still had the upper class, lower class. We did. We did by that point. Okay. Yeah. So good and bad. We've already talked about that on this podcast before. Nice. So you got selected to be a CISO, Combat Systems Officer, right? right. That's the big structure. And you went down to Pensacola. Talk us through that training and how you ended up being on the 12R. Maybe talk about the differences between some of the other options that you can get out of that opportunity. 
So prior to joining the Air Force, I didn't actually know what a combat systems officer was. When I applied to the 2011 rated board, there were three options. It was pilot, combat systems officer, and air battle manager. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what the latter two did, so I just applied for all of them. I got picked up as a CISO, and I had no idea what that would entail. just knew I wanted to be on an airplane. I wanted to be a rated officer. Mm -hmm. So for listeners who may not be entirely familiar with the Air Force specialty code system, 12 signifies combat systems officer, and R signifies the reconnaissance, surveillance, and electronic warfare specialty. I should also mention that the term CISO really only applies to undergraduate flight students who then track to become mission qualified either as a weapon systems officer, electronic warfare officer, or a navigator. We have the latter two in the RC-135 community. Okay. So like backseaters at 15s are going to be whizzos. Right, whizzos, yep. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. So you go down to Pensacola. Clearly you're, you know, accomplishing training. How does one track one or the other? How does that kind of work where you get put into the Wizzo, CISO, NAV, EWO. Sorry, I see. I'm so used to CISO because that's who I taught at right, OTS, right. right? So how do you get tracked into those different areas? So I think it's changed, actually, when I went through. When I went through in 2000. 13, the concept of the undergraduate CISO training flying program was to build a universal CISO. So everyone who graduated the program would be qualified either to be a navigator or to be electronic warfare officer. If they were going to be a weapon systems officer, F-15 backseater, they'd have to go through a little extra training at the end, but otherwise a universal CISO who's capable of any of those positions. Okay. Shortly after I graduated, they changed the configuration of the program where a couple months prior to the end of the program, each student would get a track, whether they would go to Navigator or EWO or WIZO. And then the last quarter of the program would be dedicated to that specialty. Okay. Okay. So at that point, you get selected and vectored into a specific thing. Right. And for EWO, what are the options of platforms that most of those folks go to? For EWO, we have a few. So one is the B-52 bomber, RC-135. We also have... Uh, I mean, are there a couple random cats and dogs that go to, like, the AWACS community? But, I mean, it's pretty much yeah. buffs and RC-135s, so, uh, right? Thinking, no, because Drop Night, we had buffs, we had AWACS. I think we had uh, J-Stars, we had U-2s, we had a whole bunch of things. But that was when I was going through. Oh, uh, okay. So, so that was the Drop Night. Yeah. Where it was the universal CISO, and then we had all these options arrayed okay. before us. So I knew that I specifically wanted to go to the RC-135. Okay. Either as a EO or a NAV. Got it. Okay. So that's fair that the system, it, it's change is constant, right? right it's the right. one thing that, but so you knew you wanted to go to fly on the RJ, and and so that's where you tracked. Right. And I didn't know that until I was pretty far along in the undergraduate CISO training process. I'm just going to go ahead for listeners interested. Last spring, your podcast hosted then Lieutenant Joseph Langford to discuss UCT, and he had just graduated. So for those interested in what that training program is like, all the details, the whole progression from the T6 to the T1 to all the various simulators, Joseph gives a superb overview. During my time in UCT, it was encouraged that the students talk to the instructors, find out what the program is going to be like afterward, find out what the options are, find out what airframes are available, find out what jobs on those airframes are like, deployment schedules, locations, everything else. And after doing my research, talking with the instructors, I decided that uh, RC-135 was the platform, the mission, and the lifestyle that I thought would best suit me and my family. And I was very fortunate that I put that at the top of my dream sheet, and I was very fortunate to be able to get selected for that assignment. Awesome. Awesome. So Johnny drops the RC-135. Talk to us then a little bit, the who, what, when, where, why, about where your career went after that. So where did, was the first place you were signed after you dropped the RC-135? Sure. So after Pensacola, I went to Offutt Air Force Base. That was my next assignment. And that is where the whole RC-135 fleet is stationed. Okay. All the airplanes are part of the 55th Operations Group, part of the 55th Wing, which is why if you get assigned to this particular platform, the joke is once you get off it, you don't get off it. Because unless you transition to another airframe, you're going to be there for a while. So I was there from 2014 right up through 2020. So it was uh, six years and it was a fantastic time. And I've got to travel the world during that time. And there are so many career progression upgrades and other training that you do during that time. But that is a six-year duty station when I was there. Nice. I've heard a lot of good things about Offit. A lot of Intel officers I know that have been stationed there. And I've heard that joke before, yeah. right? Once you get off it, you don't get off it. But yeah, not probably a bad thing. Maybe that can be really attractive to some people who might be looking for a little bit of more of a hometown, 
maybe that they can call their own. Sure. We don't have to go too in-depth to it, but I love Omaha. I think it's a fantastic place. I grew up on the coast in big cities. I had never been to Nebraska before. I thought, I was assuming it's cornfields and nothing else, but I was really surprised by the culture, the museums, the cafes, the restaurants, the theaters, the state parks, the national parks. It really is a fantastic place. So it was great for me. It was great for my family. That's awesome. And we've talked about, you know, pretty extensively how it's not just the member, right? There's so much that goes into these types of decisions. And it sounds like you've really found that thing that is for you. And that's fantastic. So let's explore a little bit about the life and career of a 12R. Like what's the big career milestones or what can you expect? Paint that picture for folks a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I'll go through the training pipeline a little bit for the 12R. Before uh, you start mission qualification in the schoolhouse training, the first step is usually attending water survival training and SEER school at some point. That can happen a little bit before in the UCT program, or it can happen afterward after you get to your duty station. So for those who are unfamiliar, SEER stands for Survival Evasion Resistance and Escape, where you learn wilderness survival skills and a variety of different topographies and also how to handle less than friendly interrogation techniques should you encounter such an unfavorable situation, especially important for professionals in the intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance career field. So. Yeah. yeah, you guys are flying spy planes, <laughs> right? You guys know stuff. So you need to be ready for advanced beatings. That's <laughs> yes, and I'm going to get a little bit into the semantics here because spying is different from reconnaissance. Yes, good. Thank you for doing this. I am very grateful. Yes, let's do this. So spying refers to what is largely regarded as a legal activity and intrusion. Reconnaissance means that operations are taking place with the intent of gathering intelligence with the full legal backing of the international system. Yes. So when we are flying RC-135 missions, we are abiding by a range of international agreements, uh, international law, in addition to a bunch of other national laws, U.S. federal oversight guidance and regulations. So it may seem semantic, but it's important to distinguish between spying and reconnaissance. And 100% what I do is reconnaissance. Got it. No, and I really do appreciate you elucidating that for our audience. And this is one of those like really nerdy kind of B-level things that you and I worry about and care about and think about deeply, regularly. But sometimes that nuance is lost on the Joe Schmo who's got a rifle and is ready to beat you up once you fell out of the sky into their territory. So, <laughs> But yes, it isn't just semantics. You and I know how important those really fine lines are. And that gets into some things that are, are pretty challenging. Like these jobs are hard and there's a lot going on. It's not just you fly the plane you light your hair on fire all as well. Like there's a lot more that goes into that. So how are you deliberately developed? So you said you go to SEER, you go through, what was the other? Water survival training, yeah. So what are some of the next things that you do in order to develop you to have that ability to operate in these kind of challenging, internationally significant situations that your aircraft is engaged in? Absolutely. I will say that at the beginning of the career, it focuses far more on the tactical and the technical for considering really the broad strategic implications, although we have to be aware of those even from an early stage. So after going through water swallow training, going through SEER training, getting your undergraduate sizzle wings, you go to the 330th Combat Training Squadron, so the schoolhouse for the RC-135, where all the pilots, navigators, and EWOs go for their initial qualification training, or IQT. The program takes approximately six months, and then at that point, you are certified to fly on the RC-135, and you in-process to one of the three operations squadrons that you have there. Just a quick note, I might use the term Raven. RC-135 EWOs are often referred to as Ravens. Okay. And to most people, Air Force Ravens, they think about the elite security forces who accompany high-priority airlift missions. Definitely uh, really cool. I'm not going to try to compete with them on that front. I will just say that the first Air Force Ravens were actually airborne reconnaissance photographers in the 1940s. Okay. And over the decades, that profession progressed to signals intelligence and electronic warfare support, which is how today's Ravens contribute to the fight. So just a little brief blip of history and why we're called Ravens. Awesome. No, I didn't know that. I knew a lot of our units come from a history and tradition of photographic reconnaissance. The 613th AOC out in PACAF, which was my first intelligence officer assignment, came from a bomber unit that was repurposed as a reconnaissance unit. And our logo actually is Donald Duck holding a camera over a cloud. And that was drawn by Walt Disney during World War II really? as part of their contribution to the war. That's yeah, so, really cool. I had no idea. Yeah. So it's interesting how that thread of history and tradition leads to where we are today. That's really cool. So you get qualified. And then is that when the crazy starts? Is that when the deployments and the TDYs and the, the that flying is begins? kind of when the crazy starts? So you get mission qualified, 
and you get to your operational squadron, and within three to four months, you can expect to go on your first deployment. Now, I got a caveat that changes depending on how many deployment lines are open, how many flyers are in the squadron at that time. That can fluctuate a little bit, but Ravens are expected to spend their first two years deploying when they make it to their operational squadron one to two times per year for two to four months at a time is usually the pace. Okay. So the whole purpose is to hone their technical skills, hone their operational experience, studying all the electronic warfare principles. We study that in training, but it's a perpetual self-betterment that every Raven is expected to partake in okay. to get better all the time. And then becoming familiar with all the Air Force flight ops regulations. So we're still rated aviators. It's not just about the signals. It's about everything that goes into flight ops around the world. A Raven is considered experienced when they obtain 500 flight hours. And at that point, they're eligible for subsequent training and crew upgrades. Okay. So the next step after that is instructor upgrade. You've had 500 hours in the jet. You've gone on three or four deployments. In addition to all these three-week-long Large force exercise, yep. joint red exercises, flags, yep. all that, yep. Yep. red flags, okay. Neptune Falcons, all those. So in addition to the three to four deployments, you have also done all these joint exercises and integrated with all these other platforms. So you're really getting a better sense of how your job fits into the bigger picture. So during instructor upgrade, you attend a six-week flight instructor course to study things like pedagogical theory, instructional models, and lesson planning, learning objectives, grading criteria, training reports, all those things. Yeah, sounds like my instructor training before I was an OTS flight commander, really similar. I'm assuming it's pretty similar yeah. that those concepts are consistent across the Air Force. And I found instructor training very interesting and very helpful. And a lot of the pedagogical principles and learning principles I use outside the Air Force. Yeah, so. like with my kids. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> yeah. Nice. So... Do you become a full-blown IP? Is that kind of what, I mean, is that what they call you? An instructor? I know it's instructor pilot, but do they call you IPs? It's an IE will. So instructor, electronic warfare officer. Okay. Usually the next step is an upgrade to what's called a tactical coordinator or TC. So you're an IE will, and then you upgrade to tactical coordinator, you become an ITC. The TC is the aircraft's lead EO position, and it's comparable to the mission crew commander position on other airframes. Got it. What's your rank? time in service approximately when you become a TC? You're going to be a captain when you're a TC. Most Ravens put on captain around the time they start or are about to start instructor training. Got it. Okay. And then at that point, they can go to tactical coordinator upgrade. There are cases, it's fluctuated in the operation squadrons, which one comes first, mm -hmm. depending on billets availability, all those yeah. other considerations. Rotational, ops tempo, everything. Exactly. For me, I became an instructor around the time I put on my bars, and then I upgraded to tactical coordinator about a year later. Got it. Okay. So just to give a little bit more in-depth explanation of what the difference between those two are. So Ravens are expected to be experts in electronic warfare fundamentals and signal analysis, and the tactical coordinator upgrade adds to that knowledge base with learning about all the other crew positions on the jet and how their specialties fit within the RJ mission. And then we have to study how the RJ mission itself fits into the broader battle space and how we contribute to theater national objectives, how other airframes work and how we can integrate with them, what their TTPs are and how their operating systems work. It's just learning about everything outside of our jet so that we can be the most effective as we can at providing electronic warfare support to the rest of the force. Awesome. So no pressure. Just a little <laughs> bit, right? Just a little bit. Yeah. I mean, this sounds like pretty complicated stuff, to be honest. It is complicated, and it's also super perishable. This is the kind of thing that you have to be, as an electronic warfare officer at TC, you have to be studying constantly. And temptation for a lot of TCs when they make it through that upgrade is to let all that electronic warfare fundamentals slide. That's really easy to forget, too. Parametrics and waveform and modulation and in-phase quadrature data and yeah. all those things. Stuff you and I geek out over regularly, <laughs> right. right? Yeah. Right. But all that has to be maintained in addition to how all the systems on the jet work and then how the systems on other jets work if we're going to actually provide intel expediently to them in a battle space scenario. It's a lot to absorb. It's a lot to keep up. And then there's the fact that it's always changing. Right. So yeah. doctrine changes, our adversaries update the way they employ their assets. We continually test, refine and update our own doctrine and TTPs. Yep. It is a never ending process yeah. and it's a lot of fun, but it is a lot of work. And not only are our adversaries doing things differently, they're trying to not get found out. <laughs> like That's the other yes. thing. Like, I think we don't think about that as often. We say the enemy gets a vote, but we also have to think that the adversary is also doing everything they can to not be uncovered to not be seen, to not be found, and they're making it hard on purpose. 
Definitely. So, yeah, it's all of that. Oh, and by the way, you're also an Air Force officer. <laughs> you also have professional development. Right. You also have mandatory milestones that we've already talked about, like SOS and, and these other things. So, yeah, just a lot going on. That's a really good laydown. So at this point, I'm guessing you're starting to get to be like senior captain, maybe looking at FGO time frame. Am I correct on where we are in like career field progression relative to life right now? So within the RC-135 EWO community, by the time that you put on instructor, put on tactical coordinator, usually you get certified as an evaluator by that point too. You and I know what that means, but some of our audience may not know what an evaluator is. Sure. So an evaluator means you are responsible for overseeing other aviators in your crew position on their flight examinations, which are also known as check rides. So the evaluator is the expert in all the performance and safety, qualification and certification and employment criteria for that crew position and determines if a crew member is qualified to fly or not. So most aviators, we get a check ride every year. An evaluator, you know, sits behind us and watches everything we do from mission planning throughout the flight, post ground operations, through post flight operations, through debrief for everything. Very little input, just making sure that as an observer, they can certify that we do everything that we need to do and don't do anything that we're not supposed to do. And it's really important for everyone in our audience, irrespective of your AFSC, to understand that model because it is a pilot's air force. We use that model of instructor and evaluator throughout. When I was at OTS, you could become an evaluator and you would get evaluated once a year minimum on all aspects of training, both field and classroom. And just like you describe, you walk in to go to your classroom and there's someone with a clipboard and they're like, hey, is there any reason you can't be evaluated today? You're like, nope, let's do this, right? And just like your check ride, if I fail this check ride, they're going to take my instructor qual and I'm not going to be an instructor. That happens in intelligence. That happens across the Air Force because that same model is applied. So it's important for everybody to recognize that idea of you have to be good at your job and we're going to hold you to a standard that applies throughout. And so something everybody, I think, needs to keep in mind. I had no idea it applied that way in all those other institutions. That's fascinating. I'm glad to be learning these things. Yeah. So when I was at the Intel at the AOC, we also had IQT, MQT, and then a regular evaluation. So it's that same model gets applied over and over again. So you've gotten to this point. Let's start. I know you're not there yet, but actually really close. Have they announced the uh, 04 selections yet? I know you're not. right. Okay. <laughs> so we're like right in that window. Just so you know, Johnny is like right in that window where he should be getting a phone call any minute now. So... I'm sure it's going to happen, but it's still stressful, right? It is stressful. My career scenario is a little bit unique, but just to cater some people to what they can expect at this point in their career. So mid-level senior captain for a lot of RJE was the next step is Air Force Weapons School. Mm -hmm. Last September, you discussed weapons school with Captain James Reasoner, who I actually know way back from UCT. Really? And That's yeah, outstanding. Yep. Okay. He was in the class ahead of me, and he provided a fantastic overview of that program. It was really nice to hear him again, listening yeah. to your podcast. Oh, no, that's great. So I won't go too much into weapons school. Hyper-intensive training program where students are trained in narrow details of their respective airframe and weapon system, along with so many expansive concepts of joint warfare, joint combat operations, joint air operations. So for RJ Ewos who decide to pursue a route other than weapons school, there are a variety of other alternatives. Some go to teach at undergraduate CISO training. In Pensacola. Okay. They go back to Florida. Mm -hmm. Some apply for internships or academic fellowships, like the Olmstead Scholar Program. Yep. Some get selected for staff positions at group and wing levels, and they pursue that staff area of experience. And then some cross-train to other airborne platforms and or other AFSCs okay. as well. So Air Force Weapons School is definitely a very popular one for RJEWOs, but there are other alternatives. Okay. Once you transition to that FGO time frame, do people get to stay flying or do they start transitioning to desks? I know that's something that the pilot community talks a lot about. Yes, we need people in those staff positions. I mean, do you see O5s doing the J-O-B in the jet or is that less common? Kind of help give us that 15-year look for those that are thinking about this career field. To some extent, when you start getting behind the desk, you, <laughs> you are still expected to fly, to do the duties that your primary AFSC says that you need to do. So uh -huh. you're still expected to fly, to maintain currency, to maintain all the subcurrencies that fall within the main categories of currency, mm -hmm. but you don't get to do it nearly as much. So I experienced this even going to a group staff and working as an executive officer, very intense office job with very admin heavy focus. And we would try to fly as often as we can, but you go from flying twice a week and being super proficient and constantly honing and refining those aviation and tactical and professional skills to flying once, 
twice a month if you're lucky. So there is that taper off. Yeah, that, definitely. Yeah, and reps matter. When it comes to maintaining currency on just about anything, the reps matter. Awesome. That's a super thorough lay down. I really appreciate that. And yeah. I, it's so helpful to help outline what a stereotypical career could look like. Yes, everyone's individual career is going to be wildly different. But having an idea of just the general path can be super helpful. So there are a couple of things I'd really like to pick your brain on as we move forward. We've talked to a lot of aviators. We haven't talked to as many who are part of a crew. And that's something that I would really love to explore with you because you're part of an aircraft community that has a big crew. How many people are generally on the jet when you fly? Anywhere between 20 and 30 is average for full training flights. Or for unique missions, it can go even higher than that. Wow. That is a lot of people. <laughs> it is a lot. So, and this is something that we hear a lot about us noners, you know, who aren't flying. Johnny's smiling over there when I said that. I word. do not like that term. <laughs> That's fair. Totally fair. I'm with you. I don't like it either. But, you know, just to placate those who hold those sentiments. For those of us who aren't a part of an air crew, help the audience understand a little bit some of the intricacies, the ins and outs, right? Because you're a commissioned officer on this aircraft, but a lot of the air crew isn't. But you have to work together intimately to accomplish the mission. How does that change the dynamic or maybe create different power structures and different ways of coordinating with each other? Just to help us understand this idea of crew. Yeah. If I may, I'll take a step back from the crew to just give you insight into what the inside of RJ Cabin looks like. Yeah, so love it. Like I said, we have a uniquely high number of air crew members, but we also have a wide variety of crew positions and specialties. Okay. So within a single RJ sortie, there are a bunch of submissions and priorities and objectives and tasking that goes on. So we have the pilots, we have the navigators, we have the electronic warfare officers, we have airborne systems engineers who monitor, run, and repair all the ISR equipment, and we have over a dozen intel operators and cryptologic analysts. Within that last group, there are additional specialties that I can't really discuss in detail, but that specific crew component can shift depending on the operating area we are in and also the mission requirements, which can change from day to day. So all that to say... It requires a lot of extensive and continual communication between the crew and the crew leads to make everything fit together when there's so much going on at once. Difficult because for a number of reasons, but 30 crew members means 30 different opinions at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it's very important, and RJ crews and crew members are trained in this continually, that every crew member has to be empowered to speak up and voice their concerns, especially when it comes to something like aircraft safety, but also when it comes to mission tactics and what the best course of action for that is. Every sortie is different. There's always new dynamic situations that can occur. There are always potential internal problems with equipment or with tasking. And externally, there are different adversary threats. There are weather patterns. There's so much going on, blending and mixing and continual communication is the only way that a crew, especially a crew that is that heavy and that diverse, can address that. So there are times where the crew will face a unique situation and there'll be disagreement between one or more compartments and crew positions regarding the best course of action. We all are trained in our respective specialties. Yeah. We all have our different priorities as to what this mission should focus on because the jet can only be in one place at one time. Yeah. So fortunately, we are uh, thoroughly trained in crew resource management. It's a fancy phrase for collaborative assessment and decision making, especially in high pressure scenarios. Like I mentioned, there are internal threats like equipment malfunctions, emergency procedures, and there are external factors like weather patterns, adversary threats, people who want to do us harm. So. In every instance of disagreement, the crew, in my experience, in 1,600 hours on the jet, the crew was able to consult and work through the problem, establish a way forward, and collectively execute the mission. Now, that sounds like it's a smooth process. It's not. There is a lot of talking. There is a lot of arguing. Things can get heated at points. Everyone is usually pretty good about maintaining a professional bearing, but this is an important mission, and there are consequences, some of them life or death, depending wow. on what's going on in the jet. So it can take a lot to be able to get all 30 members on board with a course of action, given different perspectives and different priorities. Sure. Very occasionally, there were still lingering differences and disputes among crew members, and those always were addressed very thoroughly during debrief. Okay. So whatever isn't resolved in the air is resolved at some point on the ground, and things have to come together. Yeah. Which is why the mission planning and the debrief is so important, because when we go up and do the same thing the next day, we have to make sure we're ready. Yeah. I can imagine that when a crew is coming together, that must be a really rewarding thing. 
even though there are disagreements and hard things you guys have to get through, but when it's working, it's got to be a pretty magical experience. It feels awesome when it's working, when the whole machine is running smoothly, when the priorities blend really well, and the aircraft is working great, and you know we're getting some fantastic intelligence. It, it just feels right, and everyone in the crew feels that way, and it's a very rewarding thing. Yeah, that's fantastic. As you're describing this scenario, I'm thinking of so many like complex leadership challenges, right? Sure. Because you're going to have to disagree with someone, and you're going to have to do that in a professional way, and then... At some point, you're going to have to get together and get to be on the same page again. Yeah. And some egos are probably going to get damaged sometimes <laughs> through some of these experiences. It does happen. And I will say that there have been a few occasions where there was pronounced interpersonal conflict. I will say that among the RJ community, the vast majority of aviators are very good about talking things through, about keeping a cool head, about being committed to a cohesive analysis and about establishing a course of action going forward. Even though there may be 30 different opinions, all 30 crew members are dedicated to finding a solution. Wow. And it's that attitude that is constantly ingrained that I see very consistently in my experience, and that's what makes it able to happen. Awesome. I really appreciate you running that down. I had an idea of what that could maybe look like. It was nowhere near the complexity that you described. That sounds like a really tough leadership challenge, and I can really see how how that could lead to a lot of really interesting dynamics just happening on a crew. How do those dynamics change or do they change maybe if an exercise or if it's just a training flight or if it's a deployment? Does it change the dynamics at all? Does it maybe raise the stakes, maybe up the pressure? What are your thoughts on the differences there? It can. Every training flight is a little bit different depending on who's going through what training, what crew positions are focusing on what priorities. Every joint exercise is different. You know, they have different objectives and different components that they try to fuse together. Every mission is different depending on where we are in the world, what geographic combatant command, what the threats are, what the mission is. Everything about the RJ mission is very dynamic and very dependent, which is why that crew resource management, the personal rapport and the professional bearing to be able to work through problems that you are going to encounter on every single sortie, that has to be there because the unexpected is the default. So it's about building the mechanisms, the interpersonal and the professional and the tactical and operational mechanisms to be able to address that dynamic environment every single time. Awesome. That is a perfect segue to the questions I want to ask about your view on being an officer, because the challenges you're facing are very different from the things I face, but I still can see some threads, some connections. Yeah. You described how the mannerisms, the bearing, the rapport that you build, you can't do that in the moment, right? When there's a disagreement on the jet about what to do, that is not the time for you to establish a connection with that crew member. That has got to have happened way before that. Absolutely. So how does that frame your perspective on officer enlisted relationships and what it means to be an officer? Sure. Before going into the officer enlisted relationship aspects, I'll just say that in regard to building that rapport, that's why, for one, mission planning is so important because we go through so many scenarios that we consider so many potential threats, so many potential challenges during mission planning. It's very comprehensive. It's very thorough because we have to make sure that the whole crew is on board with what the mission is, what the priorities are, what the objectives are, how we're going to react to challenges and threats before we even set foot on the aircraft. Yeah, because it's too late. Yep. At that point, it is exactly. too late. Which is why mission planning and then specifically training scenarios and making them as detailed and comprehensive as possible are so important. On a deployment, it takes a little bit of a different aspect just because usually it's the same crew flying together. So there's that chance to develop rapport. Okay. There's that chance to figure out the personal contributions and how they fit into that professional environment and to really know your folks and know who to talk to, understand who has what expertise and how to leverage that when something unexpected comes up. Sure. Because once you really understand an individual's knowledge, skills, and abilities, it's only then that you can really start to perform as a team because you can start to say, hey, I know you're really good at this. Exactly. So we're going to focus you there. And I can see how that would really build. Do you get really close with the folks you deploy with? I know the folks I deployed with, you tend to generate really close relationships. It does. You know, you're on a jet for, let's say, 8 to 16 hours at a time, and you're with each other most waking hours, and you're working together for professional missions of imports. And on the occasional days off, you're going out, you're with your crew and you're trying to do fun things. You're trying to decompress and it does become a family. It's weird because it's a very unique tight-knit group for two to four months at a time. Then you come back and you have to go back into other parts of life and then you come back the next deployment and it's new crew. It's new folks and you get to 
craft this whole new family. Yeah. And that's the dynamic that I've experienced. And it's been very rewarding because I've gotten to work and get to know very personally and professionally some fantastic people. And I've learned so much from all of them, even my last deployment. So I was the TC and I was working with two Ravens, but I was able to learn from them, even though I'm technically in charge of this part of the mission, but I was able to learn so much about the system and draw so much on their knowledge. And that was also really rewarding because no matter how smart you are at your job, when you're in a plane with 30 people, I guarantee you're not the best at everything. So there's so much opportunity to get better and to improve yourself by just taking advantages of all those people around you. That's outstanding. So with all of the myriad of things that you've been tasked with, right, as an EWO, we've already said this is an incredibly complex and complicated career field. What are the things that Johnny Snyder focuses on to develop himself as a leader? What are some tools that maybe you've applied? How do you develop yourself as a leader with all this other stuff that you've got to do? That's a big question. (laughs) (sighs) So to some extent, I'm a little bit ill-equipped to talk about the topic of leadership in regards to officership. Even though I'm an officer and a leader, I've been through numerous military training courses. I've taken academic classes on leadership. I've read books and scholarly articles on leadership by renowned leaders, and I've had the opportunity to lead intelligent and dedicated professionals. Even with that, I think my insights are a little bit limited. I have not explored all the philosophical implications of officership like you and Colin have on your podcast. I've tried to think more about it, partly because as I progress in the ranks, it's a little bit more important to have a foundational structure and framework that you can draw upon, especially when you're in charge of managing a large organization, whether at the squadron or the group level. So it's something that I'm working on and trying to have a more uh, structured framework that can inform my behavior. But In the meantime, I don't know precisely how to classify my leadership style. I suppose like every officer, I use my experiences from past leadership positions. As I navigate new situations, I try to absorb lessons from other leaders, whether in books I encounter or leaders that I have the opportunity to actually work with. But I will have to try to construct a more coherent framework to help make my actions and behavior as a leader stay consistent and stay beneficial to the organization. Yeah, well... I want you to know that I can see your deliberate development because Johnny and I met at the internship. We're both part of the same internship working for a combat support agency right now. And you are always open and willing to learn and listen. And I see that because you're one of the first people to say, I'm not really sure. And that knowing self is so important. It's something Colin and I talk about all the time. And to be honest, that's one of the reasons we started this podcast is because we felt that we were coming to a point where we were expecting to have that defined and figured out already, and we didn't feel that we did. So I think that's part of the intent of this podcast is to help people develop and to address that. Because it is one of those things that you necessarily haven't defined before. You've just done, you've just operated. But then when you get put in charge... You're like, oh, I maybe should have like a plan, like a co- <laughs> right? Mission planning is so important. Maybe we should apply a similar principles to our leadership style. Intuition is really crucial, but it only takes you so far when it comes to leadership responsibilities. So, yeah. and I think on the podcast, you've done a great job of exploring that and forcing, you know, people to think more analytically and more creatively about what it means to be a leader. So I appreciate that. Thanks, Johnny. That's why we're doing it. Let's try to enforce that development. I can share uh, two insights, if you like, as far as leadership. So I don't have a cohesive, coherent framework, but just a couple points that I found helpful that have defined the way I approach the way I lead. So the first is that the team dynamic defines everything. This is not a new concept, but it's just constantly shown in every professional situation I found myself in at every level that I've gone through thus far. So when I'm in the aircraft or in the office, there are almost no tasks that I can accomplish by myself. So whatever your mission or your level of seniority, success depends on the people around you. And like I said, this is a almost cliche concept, but it's still so important to recognize and to leverage. So as mission crew commander on the jet, I need the Ravens to keep me updated on the electronic warfare environment. I need the engineers to keep the equipment running smoothly and keep me apprised when something is not working correctly, because mm-hmm. that affects how we execute the mission. I need the analysts to monitor potential threats. I need various operators to help me manage off-board radio communications and data link communications. And this is just routine operations. So the most routine operations require perpetual coordination. So the leader facilitates that, but they're only part of it. And the more dense the environment, the more dynamic the situation, the more complex the mission, the more obstacles we encounter, the more vital that comes. So I've talked about just how complex and challenging an RJ mission can be. And every time the more complex it becomes, the more we need to rely on that teamwork, the more the leader needs to facilitate that cooperation. And 
to take that uh, focus on teamwork out of the aircraft, it's in the office too, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when I joined the command staff at the operations group, the Missouri River overflowed, flooded one third of Buffett Air Force Base. So you were there during that I, time? I was there during the flood, oh, yeah. My I just started my new job. <laughs> yeah, oh my gosh. I had close friends that were there. One of the guys that I was actually his sponsor. When wow. he came to Hickam, he was a patch out there at the time. Gotcha, and so gotcha. seeing all that devastation, maybe we'll try to see if we can put some links to the show notes to some of those news articles. But that was a huge deal. It was a huge deal. It's still a huge deal. It still has ramifications. But one thing that was impressive about the folks at the group and the wing is that we had resumed flight operations in two weeks. That is unreal. It is. We, <laughs> yeah. The headquarters building was under like 10 feet of water. Yeah. I mean, just the runway you had to move aircraft because you couldn't put them on the runway. It was a massive logistical feat, and I got to have a front row seat to see how effective leaders at every level, so wing group, squadron, were able to collaborate, brainstorm, plan, execute, and persevere through what was, in every sense of the word, unprecedented crisis. Yeah, so, and those skills that you develop for one thing can be applied so broadly to others. That's such an inspiring thing. I yeah. Like, again, I've had close friends who are in that situation sending me pictures and texts because I'm reaching out to them. Yeah. Hey, are you guys okay? Like, what happened just because we were worried about them? And that's remarkable. It was. My own contributions were laughably minuscule. I kept reports going and paperwork and memos. That was my job at the time. But like I said, I, I got a front row seat to see how proper leadership can overcome even challenges as uh, intimidating and destructive as that when you're able to leverage that sense of teamwork and cooperation. So that's awesome. Those that's are fantastic. buzzwords, but they matter. And that example, I think, shows just how much they can matter. Yeah, no, and that's fantastic. And Colin and I have said this many times. Sometimes these things sound like motivational posters, but there's <laughs> yeah. a kernel of truth behind them, right? There is. Awesome. So, Johnny, you talked about the teamwork. That's one of the really important things as a leader. What was the other thing you wanted to talk about with that? Right. My second point, and it's going to sound boring and banal, but it's the importance of paperwork. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. So you and I have mixed feelings on this, but I think we can both agree that it's still very crucial yeah. and very important to any number of aspects of an Air Force career. So no one joins the Air Force with dreams about writing reports and memorandums. Yes. <laughs> So many times I love flying and paperwork seems like a distraction from flying. It seems like it's taking me away from the mission, like it's a drain on my productivity. But the reality is that paperwork keeps organizations running and the Air Force is no exception. So on the operational side, every deployment needs orders. Every aviation rule is defined in flight publications and checklists. Every sortie needs flight orders and crew rosters and schedules. And then on the administrative side, which you and I both know very well, every policy decision is captured in an official document. Every new initiative requires a memorandum. Every promotion decision depends on performance reports and training reports and decoration citations. Yep. So I've tried to explain this to some of the newer officers who've come into my flights or my units. When you're a pilot who's recovering a jet from an in-flight emergency or you're an ISR operator who's in the midst of discovering some brand new intelligence, that achievement is more real and remarkable than any piece of paper, hands down. But no matter how important or impressive that is, it won't really matter in the long run unless it's captured on a piece of paper. Yeah, exactly. It's like the meme, right? Like picks or it didn't happen. <laughs> That's where we are, right? Yeah. If it's not recorded appropriately in paper, it might as well have not happened. Yep. And you and I have both heard the truism before that you don't meet the board, your paperwork does. And that saying is partly cynical, but it also reflects the reality that, you know, decision makers are unable to know everyone personally. So you need to capture everything on paper. You need to make sure that the training reports and performance reports and decorations and awards are all captured for people to see. That's how you sum up someone's achievements. And yes, the paper is not the same thing as achievements, but the paper is what makes those achievements and accomplishments available for the rest of the institution to see and acknowledge. So I don't know if someone else come up with this analogy. So you mentioned the picture didn't happen. I use the analogy of like, it doesn't matter how good a musician is if they don't record a track. Yeah. No one's yeah. ever going to know just how great they were. And it's the, the same thing with the Air Force paperwork to some extent. Yeah. Just an organization of our size, breadth, depth, scope of responsibility, there's just no other way. Exactly. And Colin and I did just spend a couple episodes decrying how awful the system is. <laughs> but in all seriousness, there's no other way. You, you simply can't do it until until the matrix happens and we can all plug into each other's brains and know immediately that's where we are. Right. And so, yeah, it's super critical. And a lot of this. So writing comes easier to some people than to others. Says the English major. <laughs> Says the English major. <laughs> 
But you know what? I'm an English major, but I had to practice writing Air Force style. Yes. That did not come uh, naturally to me. So it was soul crushing to me when I first started writing bullets because up until then I had studied essays and poetry yeah. and plays <laughs> and theater and novellas. And now I have to write these clumsy, segmented, confusing, jargon laden bullets. Yeah. And I had to practice getting good. Yes. Especially when I became flight commander of the office responsible for reports and decorations for the unit. Yeah. So, and you've discussed this in your podcast, but performance reports can change and they are likely to change in the next couple of years. And Air Force writing conventions are likely to change. But if you're an officer, you need to become proficient writers in whatever communication vehicle the Air Force uses at that time for the sake of the people you lead. And and for your own career. So it does sound banal to say, yep, paperwork's important, but it truly is for so many reasons. Yeah, totally agree. So Johnny, what are some books, Mr. English Major, what are some things you are reading lately that have really piqued your interest or maybe those books that have just really meant something to you that you refer to people to over time? We like to ask our guests some of their, their big favorite books. All right, I got to take a breath. Okay. And I got to try to narrow things down for you. Okay, okay. There's so many. Yeah. What I'm going to talk about is Thucydides, History of the Peloponnesian War. Okay. It is an intimidating... Chaos Mattis on us here, right? <laughs> yeah. It is an intimidating tome. So just for the listeners, the History of the Peloponnesian War covers the two-decade war between Athens and Sparta and their respective allies in the 5th century BC. It's written in a dry, sterile prose, and there are some contextual specifics that it's difficult for a contemporary reader to understand and identify with. But beyond those challenges to the reader, Thucydides captures so many timeless universal truths defining human conflict and ambition and power and failure. He includes eloquent speeches and dialogues on debates from a diverse array of leaders around the ancient world. And then you get to meet some of the most heroic and the most villainous characters and everyone in between coming from all different sides of this catastrophic war. And so many of his passages are so stunningly poetic and profound. I was flipping through just yesterday, rereading some passages, and some of them are truly moving and deeply emotional and evocative. And that level of experience combined with just the universal truths that geopolitical power being influenced by fear, honor, and interest. Just fundamentals that are as true today as they were 2,500 years ago. Awesome. Do you have a particular translation that you recommend? Maybe you can give us a link to that and we can share it with our audience. Yeah, absolutely. So there's an edition by Robert Strassler. His notes and explanations make everything easier to understand. Awesome. So even if you're not uh, really into classical literature and archaic texts, he makes it pretty accessible. Awesome. Perfect. Yeah. And we'll provide a link to that in the show notes. What are some other things? I mean, we've already started pretty heavy, so <laughs> I'm looking forward to this. Do you have a little bit of time? I, we got some time. This oh, is important okay. stuff. Colin and I have done an entire episode on the importance of reading. We've talked about how to read a book. This is important stuff. So yeah, absolutely, we have time for it. One of my Air Force friends recently commented on how he was tired of dealing with officers who were better at quoting Simon Sinek than actually leading, right? Yeah. I can relate to that feeling, so no offense to Sinek, who's a brilliant thinker and author, but... A lot of aspiring leaders, including myself, we tend to cut and paste profound sayings and ideas and just paste them onto our metaphorical bumper sticker display yeah. rather than internalizing and thoughtfully applying these concepts. So I understand some of these are going to sound cliche, and I understand if people's reaction is to roll their eyes at my recommendations, but I think that some of these books are so substantive and valid that if you choose to engage with them on your own terms, you'll be able to find a lot of value past all the overquoted passages. With that said, <laughs> one of the most uh, overquoted works of strategic philosophy is uh, Sun Tzu, Art of War. Yep. And I know because I've been personally annoyed by how much his concepts are lazily applied by mediocre leaders and instructors. But as I said before, there's still so much to gain from reading these volumes because his insights are so dense and layered. And every time I read it, I encounter new aspects and angles and perceptions. Yep. So his aphorisms can be very vague and abstract, especially to Western audience unfamiliar with the kind of sentence and idea structure of the Chinese language. And then just, just how broad in general his concepts are can make them difficult to apply mm -hmm. towards a lot of situations. So it's hard to probe his intended meaning. The entire cultural construct through which he was writing that. Yes. The Eastern versus Western constructs of time, of relationship between state and people. I mean, it's very complex. Absolutely. Yet, in spite of that, his concepts are so 
brilliant about warfare as deception, about subjugating an adversary without fighting, about understanding yourself and understanding your adversary, about exercising self-control and tranquility and what some would call professional bearing, attacking the adversary's plan instead of their army, blending caution with speed and the orthodox with the unexpected. These are all concepts that are very vivid right now and that I think a lot of our leaders are trying to incorporate and, and address and internalize. Yeah. I will say that I found it very helpful to read the other military classics uh, of ancient China. Okay. So that was really helpful to me in deconstructing Sun Tzu a little bit more. So I also read the dialogues of Wu Tzu and Wei Liao Tzu and Li Jing. So pardon to any Mandarin speakers for my pronunciation. But the dialogue of Li Jing was especially helpful because it explores the practical applications and fuller meanings of uh, Sun Tzu. Th this was great. I, I was reading again uh, a couple weeks ago, but there's a part where the speakers say, people who study Sun Tzu today only recite the empty words. Few grasp and extend his meaning. Merely remembering and reciting them is not enough to succeed. Military teachings should not be carelessly transmitted. And I found that to be a very convicting reminder to myself and to some extent to the institutions we're a part of. Yeah, I remember reading that as a second lieutenant and distinctly recognizing that it was too soon. <laughs> it was too soon in my development as a military professional that I needed some more life experience. I needed some military experience and I needed more development before I was really ready to appreciate some of those things. So yeah, I'm listening on that one for sure. Cool. This other one's going to seem archaic, but I read this one last year and it illuminated a lot for me, especially within our time and climate and domestic events, international events, but two volume book called Democracy in America by French political scientist Alexis de Tocqueville, who traveled throughout America, early 19th century, wrote extensively about what he described as its inclinations, character, prejudices, and passions. The reason it's so fascinating is because it reveals ways that America has changed and has not changed in the past 200 years, for better and for worse in both cases. Mm -hmm. So there are areas where Tocqueville, a French aristocrat from the 19th century, his presumptions are archaic and problematic, absolutely, and those have to be dealt with. But in other areas, he is prophetically progressive. He investigates shifting social norms and historical identities and ideological conflicts around buzzwords like liberty, equality, governance, and commerce. Mm -hmm. And he also, with a lot of humility, he's able to take on some heavy topics regarding race and class and privilege. And he deconstructs so many of the falsehoods and failures still embedded today within American narratives. And even though he harshly criticizes the pitfalls of kind of our political and social characteristics, he also is very generous and praises the successes, both the moral ones and the material ones, where they occur. And it is a deeply convicting and incredibly insightful book for all its faults. And I found it really helpful reading it now. Nice. Yeah. And as executors of the Constitution and the authority therein, through our commission, this is the context by which our authority comes from. This is where it happens. Yeah. So, yeah. Exactly. Very insightful. Well, Johnny, this has been super awesome. I am so glad you were able to join us today. And for any of our audience who may want to reach out to you, you've been willing to give us your email address. We'll put that in the show notes, but you can look him up in the gal, Jonathan Snyder, Captain, U.S. Air Force. But we'll provide a link in the show notes if you want to reach out to Johnny to get any more insights on the 12-hour career field or any of his deep and profound thoughts on what's going on in the South China Sea. We've had many conversations <laughs> and they've been fantastic. I've really enjoyed it. Anything else you want to leave us with before we wrap up today, Johnny? No, it's been a pleasure and a privilege to be on this podcast. Thank you very much for hosting. I hope that despite some of my incoherent ramblings that I may have contributed a couple nuggets that will be useful to your listeners. Uh, I'm sure it will be. Hey, really appreciate you joining us this week. All right, Reed. So I said it in the intro. I'm going to say it again here. Johnny is amazing. He's one of those not just 50 pound brains, but like 200 pound brains in the room. <laughs> and it just makes me so excited. Well, one makes me so humbled. It makes me feel like an ignoramus but so excited that these are the people that we get to spend our time with. They're just so full of good knowledge and information. And at the same time, so humble. Like I couldn't detect any sort of pride or conceit in his voice. Like he just knows his stuff and is so good at talking about it. Yeah. I love that. These are the kind of people that we get to be around as airmen, as officers in the air force. Yeah, absolutely. I've said it before. I joined because of the mission I was going to get to do. I stay because of the people I get to be associated with. Right. And Johnny is no different. He's capital J Johnny, amazing guy, just incredible. 
I mean, he's quoting from other ancient Chinese military theorists. Right? <laughs> I mean, come on. I mean, we all know Sun Tzu, but he, like, goes and finds the other ones. Yeah, that wrote about Sun Tzu. And yeah, okay. Yes, these are the people we get to be associated with. And it's an honor and privilege. I thought he had some really good points. I know you and I have got some things lined up we want to talk about. Why don't you lead us off on the thing that, aside from his genuine intelligence, which is always a privilege, I, I love listening to him talk. What are some of the things that stood out to you? One of the very first things that jumped out is how accurate he wants to be. Because he is that 200-pound brain, he wants to make sure that everything he says is to the point and that there's no ambiguity about it. And this came out when you in jest said something about being a spy, and he was like, hold up, Reed. No, yeah, it's recon. And I do think it's important that we address that, just as he did, take a little bit further, because words do matter, right? There's a difference between spying and reconnaissance. Yeah, absolutely. And he did a good job of describing that key difference. It's the idea of attribution. In one case, the country is not going to recognize that you were there. Yeah. That's the spying side of things. They're not going to say, oh, yeah, that's us. Reconnaissance, we're following all the laws. Everybody knows we're there and everybody knows what we're doing. And yes, in the setting at the time, I was just trying to get him to open up, get him to free flow. It's an interview technique. Sure. And I love how he's like, no, <laughs> that's just the excellence of people like Johnny. And I think it's something we can all strive for. And I can be precise when the occasion warrants, but sure. I could be more precise more often. And that was something I took away from the interview as well. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. And because he is so precise, the interview is just full of uh, so many really good things to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. I think that we should be precise about is the developmental framework moving from being an instructor to being an evaluator. Because you said in the interview that that is applied everywhere, but that is actually more specific to the operational environment of the Air Force and not so much the support side. So I wanted to make sure that we were precise on that one. Yeah, no, that's totally fair. And as you and I discussed before we recorded today, I'm using the ops lens. That's the world I come from. I'm in the operations side of things. And so the idea of initial qualification training, mission qualification training, and then instructor and evaluator, that model is something that has been ever present in my career. Everywhere I've gone, yeah. I've had this model of let's give you the first skills you need. Then we're going to train you up to get more specifically qualified. Then you're going to be fully mission qualified. And then once you're qualified, you can become someone teaching others. And then you can be someone evaluating others. That idea, which has a lot of merit, and it's been very useful as a framework for teaching and instructing and bringing others along, that's been my experience. And so glad that you highlighted that that hasn't been applied everywhere. Still, I think there's some ideas that we can take out of that and just key in, because you'll hear those words, IQT, MQT, yeah. FMC. You'll hear all these things out there, and I think that's what I was trying to bring out. No, and you're exactly right. The point that I want to make is not that the framework is wrong or that it's not useful. It just hasn't permeated to other places mm -hmm. within the Air Force. Those are not terms that are frequently used in, at least in civil engineering. I can't speak exactly for the other support career fields, but we don't have instructors. We don't have IQT, MQT. When we talk about FMC, fully mission capable, we're talking about a building. Yeah. Very different context for the use of that term, as opposed to an aircraft or the people that are operating it, right? Yeah. So just wanted to be precise there. That's all. Yep. Totally agree. I wanted to bring out, and I know we wanted to discuss, is the magic that can happen when a crew is working together. Yeah. This is one of the most important things that I think anybody who listened to this episode is going to take away from this, because there are some really powerful and very important concepts that you discuss with Johnny that we're going to readdress here. So everybody who's listening, pay attention, because this is some really important stuff. Yeah. So Colin, what is it that you, because you and I talked about this, what is it that you really wanted to bring out here? I know I've got my things, but what is it you wanted to bring out? Yeah. So the thing that jumped out to me in the interview is when Johnny was talking about 
the like the operational cycle in describing the air crew environment within the RJ. There's 30 different people doing lots of different jobs. Some are analysts, some are engineers, some are listening to the beeps and squeaks, some are operating the aircraft. There's a wide variety of AFSCs and every single one of them has their own opinion, right? But the way that he described it is that he said that with every deployment, every exercise, every rotation, there's this opportunity there to craft a new family. Yeah. And I thought those words were so interesting. Yeah. Because it's not just a team and it's not just cobbling together a group of individuals who are going to move in the same direction just by virtue of being on the same airplane, right? Mm -hmm. But deliberately crafting, putting all the cogs and pieces together to build a family of all things. Yeah. And he describes this magical moment when everybody is honed in on the mission, they're fully capable, they're competent, and most importantly, they're connected with each other. Yeah. That is when they become a family, just like you would experience back at home. The love and the care that you have for each of these individuals is there. Even if they drive you nuts sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And absolutely. they will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's what really stuck out to me is his choice of words. Again, words matter. Yeah. And he's the kind of person who is precise. And so mm -hmm. that was really important to me. Yeah. And I think back on this same idea in team sports. That's where it first really happened for me. Mm -hmm. When you've been with a group of people long enough, you've had the experiences requisite for you to really become one with this group, right? And when you can look at somebody across the field and they know exactly what you're thinking, you know exactly what they're thinking, and you don't even have to think or say anything out loud, they're just going to react and you know how to leverage their skills and overcome their weaknesses with your strengths and that back and forth. That was the first time that happened for me. It's happened to me in the Air Force on deployments, on exercises, things of that nature, and it is incredible. And that's what I wanted to highlight is... Mm -hmm. For those in our audience who may have not had that kind of experience, seek it out. Try to find those experiences because when you get a group of people, whatever it is, it could be literally sitting in an office space in a cube farm somewhere. But when you're actually doing the job and everyone's on the same page and everything's working, it's magic. Something yeah. really impressive happened. You called it crew magic when we were talking yeah. before this episode. And it can be really, really amazing. Yeah. And know that some of these different exercises and deployment opportunities, those things are not always required. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they are. You will get voluntold to go do some of these things, but that's not always the case. And you may find yourself thinking, I don't need to volunteer for that because I don't need the practice. I'm already fully capable. I'm competent. I don't need to go do that. But we would suggest to you that maybe you should go in order to not practice your competence, but to practice your connection. Yes. Go so that you can practice connecting with these other people because whether you're a 12R or a 32E or a 14N or a 44G, it doesn't matter what your AFSC is. You work with people. Yes. And you need to be able to connect with them regardless of the environment because that is your responsibility as an officer. Yes. And that was actually an important aspect of training at OTS. We took your cell phone away on purpose so that you did not have the ability to, as quickly as you're used to, relying on your existing social structure and social network mm -hmm. so that you would be forced to connect with the people in your flight. That's not even a secret. I told them straight up, like, why did I take your phones? Because I need you to be friends with these people. I need you to connect with them. And I totally agree. You can do this outside of an exercise, outside of a deployment. I just think those are uniquely excellent opportunities to do that. It's a lot easier to connect with somebody once you're locked in a room for 18 hours with them, doing night shift and whatever it is, tracking enemy aircraft or something that I've done before. So take advantage of those opportunities. I have made deep and meaningful connections with people I spent three weeks with. Yeah. And you're going to take advantage of not only the skills that you learned, the skills to connect, the competence to connect, yeah. but also the actual connection. These will be people that you'll be in touch with and you'll see them again. We've talked on this podcast before. The Air Force is a scary small place. Yeah. And so you may find that that connection that you develop in these TDYs, these exercises, deployments, 
will come to benefit you later on when you find yourself in another combat sortie or needing to get another contract done or things are falling apart within the flight and you need somebody to just listen to you. Mm -hmm. That's the reason we need to connect with each other so that we can help each other accomplish the mission, whatever the mission is. Yeah, totally agree. So I do have one more thing that I want to address here. It goes a very different direction, but Johnny talked about after the training pipeline ends. So you go to UCT, you go to learn your airframe, and then you arrive at your first duty station. For the EWOs in the RC-135 rivet joint community, that's off it. He talked about there's really just the one place. Then he used the phrase, that's when the crazy starts. And what he meant by that is pretty soon after that, you are going to deploy and then you're going to deploy again. And there will be these exercises, just kind of like what we've been talking about. Yeah. And I want to talk about how for some career fields, that's what things are like on the complete opposite spectrum from, say, a force support officer or a CE officer, or finance, or even like a 14N, because there's tons of you guys. Yeah. Literally, you can go anywhere. but Ewos, these 12 Romeos, there's not very many of them, right? Yeah, and there's not a whole lot of places they can be. Yeah. But they're busy. They are super busy going everywhere, but not stationed everywhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is a difference. Yeah, absolutely is a huge difference. And yeah, I thought he did a good job of describing how many days you're going to be away, the ops tempo. And those are important things to consider when you're thinking about what kind of job you want to do. He mentioned how when he was at UCT that he interviewed other officers, talked to them, asked them, because it's not just the ops tempo, it's not just the aircraft, it's the community mm -hmm. that is a part of that aircraft. It's a community. It's fascinating. You can be in a group of F-22 drivers and then a group of F-16 drivers, and they are different. Yeah. They're still pilots. They're still fighter pilots but they're different communities. They have a different way of being. And so yeah, it's important if you have the opportunity to try and identify those things because, Colin, we've talked about it. You need to know you. You need to know self and where you are going to be most successful. And honestly, who are we kidding? The cadre at your various training experiences are going to be good at helping what that looks like. Mm -hmm. That's part of the reason we bring them back to the schoolhouse is to find the people that they think should be in those locations. But yeah, no, totally agree. Very interesting point, because it is different than a lot of other jobs out there. Yeah, and the exact term that it gets used around the Air Force is high demand, low density, that there are these career fields that are going everywhere all the time, and there's just not that many of them as opposed to others, which we could still say high demand. 14N, intelligence officers, CE officers, space operations, Still high demand, but there's a lot more of them and there's a lot more other places that they can go. Yeah, totally agree. So glad we could bring Johnny on. He was so eloquent, so intelligent, and always a treat. He's in our group here at Fort Meade, and he is just such a great addition. He's a lone 12R in a group of 14Ns. Mm -hmm. And boy, the experience and background he brings, it's fantastic. It's really great to have him, and I'm glad he was able to join us today. Yeah, this was an absolute pleasure to listen to what Johnny had to say. Really appreciate the level of thought that he brings to being an officer and those measured responses, very articulate, very precise. Really, really enjoyed that. And if you enjoyed it, those of you that listen to this, please share it with your network. Make sure that others are aware of this level of knowledge and make sure that they are aware that these kinds of opportunities exist to be an EWO on a RC-135, and work in an environment where they can experience that type of crew magic on a regular basis. Absolutely. And as always, if you have any questions, we're always happy to answer. We love to hear from you, our audience. If there's nothing else, Colin, I think that'll wrap it up for this week. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Commission Ed. Commission Ed.